Well, good morning again, everyone. And uh, here in England, we still have a bit of lockdown, even though things have been relaxed a bit. And I know that there are people who are listening to these sermons in other parts of the world. I know I have Spanish friends who have really come out and they are much, much more relaxed now than they have been over the past few weeks and months as it relates to this uh, pandemic lockdown. Uh, others of my friends in America are still facing quite a challenge and depending on which state they live in, things are different from state to state. Those who are in New York are really challenged by what's going on there, and our prayers are with you as uh, it relates to the future. But here, as I say, uh, even this past week, we have had things relaxed a bit more, but we still face the uh, uh, challenge of not being able to meet together as a church in the same building, and so we continue to provide only this outlet for sermons on a Sunday morning. But it's a privilege and it's an honor, and as we frequently say, if this had all hit us some months or weeks or years ago, things would have been much, much more difficult than they are now as it relates to how we manage our fellowship together. Uh, there have been some beautiful things come out in this uh, during this pandemic of uh, churches who have gathered around the world most of you will be aware of the song the blessing which has been sung by many nations yesterday i had the opportunity to listen to the one which has been put together in the american state of hawaii and i was just moved again by the way the spirit of the lord uh, really uh, ab is able to unite hearts even under the most difficult of circumstances. So we thank the Lord for what we have and pray that things will continue to get better. Today, as we look at the subject which is uh, in front of us, we're closing out the series of messages today called The Battles That We Face. And so, because we're closing it out, I just want to give you the review of all of those that we've covered. We've talked about the battles we face of the mind. We talked about three things as it relates to the mind. We talked about addiction, we talked about depression, and we talked about affection. Then we moved on to the body and we talked about the eyes and the tongue and appearances. When we moved into the last of the three, we talked about the battles we face of the spirit, and we dealt with diversity. And last week, we talked about conviction. So today, and finally, we're going to look at the subject of holiness. And it's an interesting subject because as that topic is explored, there have been those through the years who have either underemphasized the importance of holiness, personal holiness, or they have overemphasized personal holiness. And you say, well, how can you overemphasize it? There have been those groups of people who have put um, contingent upon your level of personal holiness as to how much God actually will do for you or loves you or um, will carry out his promises to you, all contingent upon your own personal level of holiness. There are scriptural teachings, I believe, which say that God is not looking um, to bless us based upon our personal holiness as much as he is on our allowing the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, to be holy within us. We read verses that the apostles have written stating that uh, in me that is in my flesh there dwells no good thing. We read as we have in the past in the book of Isaiah talking about even the best thing. All of my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Those are the best things we can do and those are detestable and stinky in the eyes and um, uh, nostrils of God. 
But when it comes to holiness, I believe that there is an importance about it that is required and stressed throughout Scripture, that God does desire for us to be holy. And it's a battle because we have this thing going on in us that's, ta that's uh, called our sinful nature, that natural part of us that battles with our spirit. The Apostle Paul talks quite frequently in the New Testament about that which I would do, I don't do, and that which I would not do, that I do. And he's talking about this constant conflict between his spirit and his flesh. So it's by all means a battle to be holy, but nevertheless we are challenged to be holy. So I thought about the subject and went and pulled out one of my old study Bibles that I have used in the past in looking at this subject, because I remembered there were quite extensive references dealing with holiness, and I picked out a few that I want to read to you before we even launch into our points. As it deals with holiness, right back at the beginning in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11, the Bible says, Who is like unto thee, O God, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? So there is the reference of God's holiness and how holy God is, going all the way back to the beginning, an emphasis upon that. And the, state, uh, the statement, in fact, that no man can be like you. Nobody can live up to your holiness. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 20, And the men of Bethshemus said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall we go up? Um, and to whom shall he go up from us? Who can get close? Who can even come close to the holiness of God? And of course, it's a rhetorical question because the answer is no one. No one can get that close. In the New Testament, we'd read verses in Romans that talk about none righteous, no, not one. None of us have the capability of becoming as holy as God. Another verse is Psalm chapter 99 and verse 9. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And those words are repeated again in Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 7, in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, and in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. There is this repetition of the fact that God is holy. A side note, many wonder why of the repetition of the words holy three times. I have to say and remind you, uh, tongue in cheek, God does not stutter. It's not that God was saying holy, holy, holy because he needed to think about his next phrase. He was using those words, I believe, to identify the three parts of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. The last verse I want to read before we begin our points is Revelation chapter 15 and verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. There is a command and a desire on the part of God that we should worship him, that we should come to him in spirit and in truth, and that we should desire to be holy as he is holy. We should have a motivation for holiness. The first point I want to make in reference to this is we have a motivation for holiness. Our motivation for holiness is that nothing holds us back 
from our service for God. It becomes our focus, the focus of our attention. Some people wonder and ask the question, why be holy? The, uh, the, the desire and the motivation is so that nothing will hold us back from doing all that God wants us to do. If you have your Bibles there, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 in the New Testament. This is where one of the apostles, many believe it's Paul, others are afraid to say, uh, actually wrote an epistle to those who were Hebrews, children of Israel, and purposely did not want to be identified. Here in chapter 12 and verse 1, we read these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Verse 2 is an important verse coupled with it as well. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We can stop there or I'll read the whole chapter because it's all so good. But the idea, the motivation is you need to throw off everything which would hold you back. And you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. Focus upon him. It is enough motivation to think that God's desire for us is to accomplish everything he set out for us in life. Also, to carry out and to accomplish everything that he wants accomplished for his kingdom through us. As we focus on that desire... It says we need to do everything that we can to be able to keep from being held back. Back when I was in high school in the 1970s, then of course there was a lot of attention upon, um, always were, it was every four years on the Olympics and those who were uh, fantastic Olympians and who won multiple gold medals at those events and the, the potential and chance for it. And I remember specifically there was a swimmer who was American called Mark Spitz. And he was amazing. He won multiple gold uh, medals for his swimming. But there was one point that many were critical of later as it related to his swimming, and that was the length of his hair. Mark Spitz, of course, in the 1970s didn't want to come out of the pool and not look cool. <laughs> he wanted his hair length to reflect the day and age in which he lived, and so he left his hair at a longer length. Years in the future, many look back upon that and say, I wonder how much faster he would have gone if he would have shaved his head, or if he would have cut his hair, or if he would have worn a cap or something which would have kept him from being held back. And it's very interesting. Of course, there was subsequently a lot of controversy over those who were swimmers and who wore specific costumes made of Teflon-type materials, which were less resistant in the water. And uh, many of them were debated. I, I can't even tell you at the moment whether they were ultimately ruled against or for, but there was a lot of debate over it because of how much quicker the swimmers would be if they were to make it so there was less resistant, less resistance in the water. I use that because I think that's the type of thing God is challenging us with when it comes to our ability to do what he wants us to do. He's saying, throw off anything that'll hold you back. Get rid of anything that will keep you from accomplishing all of what I want you to accomplish and all of what I want you to accomplish for me. So there is the desire and focus, 
But then he also says we need to fix our eyes on him. We need a focal point. We need some place to put our attention so that we can attain and reach our goal. My second point this morning, and I've made this multiple times from the pulpit as it relates to our character, and I, I make it again because I believe it's so important. As it relates to holiness, God's desire for us is to be clean and be available. It's so simple when you think of it, that God's desire for us is to be clean enough to be used and to be available. I've many times used the illustration of my dad's pegboard tools and how that anytime he went to use tools, he wanted to find that his tools were where they belonged and that I'd cleaned them up since the last time I used them. Because if you go for a tool and it's A, not where it should be, you can't use it. Number two, if you go for the tool and it's there, but it's not been cleaned, you can't use it. God's desire is that we be clean and be available. Look at Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51. This verse is so necessary and important that there have been those who have written songs about it, choruses about it. I could sing it for you, but I won't. I don't want to violate copyright on YouTube. But as it relates to this, Psalm chapter 51 and verse 1. Or sorry, Psalm chapter 51 and verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart, O God. You know, it's interesting that the psalmist doesn't emphasize that he'll do it on his own. The psalmist doesn't spend time talking about how he intends to clean his heart up. If anything, there's an instant admission to the fact that he can't because he's requesting that God help him, that God do what he can't. He's asking them to create within him. Is it not God who created us to begin with? Is it not us or is it not God who can fix us, make us what we should and want uh, him to, to make us to be? Create in me a pure heart, O God. And then he says, renew a steadfast spirit within me. The ability to stay there, not just to get clean, but to stay clean. We emphasize quite a lot within Christianity that we serve a forgiving God. I'm thankful we do. We talk quite a lot about how that if we, uh, if we falter and if we fall, that he'll be there to pick us up, that he has and offers forgiveness to us, and that's very true. There ought to be, though, maybe a little bit more emphasis on not faltering and not falling to begin with. There was this old phrase that talked about, I can't remember who the famous man was who said it. If you do a Google search, you'll find it. But there were those who used to say, you can't keep a bird from landing in your hair, but you can keep him from building a nest there. You'll instantly, some of you know exactly who it was who said it. I had a wise professor, actually, once, who challenged that thinking. He looked up from his notes after he'd quoted it, and he said these words, Actually, you can do a lot to keep a bird from landing in your hair to begin with. Very good point. I think sometimes we emphasize so much on not having the bird build the nest that we forget there are some things you can do to keep a bird from landing there in the first place. We talk as Christians quite a lot about the forgiveness of God from the sins that we commit. Maybe we don't talk enough about not committing them to begin with. We do have an ability 
to stay away from it. We have an ability to stay distant from the things that we are uh, so easily beset by, as the scripture says. Look at another place. Look at Psalm chapter 139. Just a few pages more towards the end of the book. Psalm chapter 139. I'm going to read two verses here. Verses 23 and 24. The Bible says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. There is an invitation by the psalmist here to search me. I believe when we come to the end of our own search, when we've done all that we can do, we can turn to God and say, Lord, please help me to be able to find any other areas which need your attention, which need your cleansing touch, which need to be made holy like you are holy. Search me, know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. The psalmist doesn't stop by saying, I want you to identify everything wrong with me. He goes on to say, and will you help me fix it? Will you lead me in the way everlasting? Will you help me deal with those things that are holding me back? Will you give me strength to address them? If I have areas in my life that aren't holy, will you help them become holy the way you want them to be? There's an invitation which says, God, you created me. You know what my issues are. Help me. Father, make them be what they should be. My third point and final one is we have an example and we have a help. Our example and our help. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 in the New Testament towards the end of the book. One of the small epistles. 1 Peter chapter 1. One Peter chapter one, and let's look at verse. Let's start in verse fourteen. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Verse fifteen. But just as he who called you is holy. So be holy in all you do, for it's written, Be holy because I am holy. There is an example which has been set for us. Verse 17, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. There is a father leading an example for us. And this example set by God for us is holy. So that we can conform to the image of his son. <clears throat> One of the things which was predetermined, predestined before the foundation of the world. Is that we would be conformed to the image of God's son. God's desire for us is to be holy as he is holy, to have created within us a heart and a mind the way that Christ's heart and mind are. Philippians addresses this when he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There is a desire that the mind of Christ be within us, and we have this example to follow. But more than an example, he's also our help. He doesn't just show us what we should be like. 
He leads us by example, and he helps us to obtain what it is he wants us to be. You say, well, how do you know that's true? I mentioned Philippians. Turn back to the book. Look at um, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, a verse many of you will be very familiar with. We'll start in verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And then verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We have the promise of God that what we don't do, what we can't do, he will accomplish. He's the one who started the work in us, and he will complete it right into the end. If you don't right now have a desire to be holy, you need to have one. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you haven't even started you need to submit your life to him to begin with. Don't try to clean it up. It's as silly to say that as it would be to someone to say, well, I tell you what, I really would like to get a little better. I'd like to feel a little better before I go to the hospital. I, I don't really want to go to the hospital until I'm feeling well enough to. That's silly. You come to God in the condition that you are because he's there for our help. He's there to help us. So we submit ourselves to him, and that's where we start. And then when we're released from hospital, we're always released with instructions. Take these medicine. Take this medication. Do these exercises. Look after yourself in these ways. We are left with instructions so that we might get better. We might improve. God says, I'll help you do those things, but there has to be a desire on our part to want to do them. As I close this, I hope that you'll spend some time reflecting upon the things and areas in your life that need addressing. Areas that need to become holy that aren't holy. Things that need to be thrown away out of your life that you're currently clinging to. I hope and pray that it's your desire, as it is mine, that we might be more like Jesus, more usable, and able to accomplish his purpose for us. Father, thank you for this opportunity Take this message and apply it to our lives as we apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.